Betty and Lee Jim. He's just stressing it. Hubler. The Hubler's house. Hubler. Okay. Melton, would you pray for these now, please? Verse 17, we're going to be discussing the five keys of Scripture. Could I have somebody read for us, roll out verses 17 and 18 of Re Revelation chapter 1. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though he were not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are the that are and those that are to take place after this. All right, thank you, Donna. All right, we're going to find here that Scripture makes use of the mention of keys, specifically keys, keys, plural, of death and Hades. But uh, those keys represents Christ's authority in the church and his authority over the world. He's a lot of keys. What, what does that tell you about that person? 
the people don't have access to. Okay, good. Responsibility. Responsibility, too. You know, who they're going to let in and who they're going to let out. You know, you think of keys of a jailer. They have control. They have control. Uh, importance of keys. And uh, he was telling me the other day, he's one of the newer people of our church, but when you hear the doors and the bars closing behind you and you realize you're not getting out, even if you are, you know, a uh, officer without somebody else's help, somebody that has the appropriate keys and ability to open the doors. And so that's what we're seeing here. Jesus describes himself as saying, I have the key to fill that in. The first set of keys are the keys of death and the keys of Hades. Now the word Hades is the same in the English as it is in Greek. And then the word death is the word Thanatos or Thanos. You know, that's some, sometimes it's short for Thanos. Uh, those of you that like Marvel move, movies, um, you know, one of the bad guys, his name is Thanos. And the Greek word for death or Thanatos. Um, you know, Michelle and I went to Israel with some of you all. And uh, while we were there, we went to Caesarea Philippi. And that is where Jesus said, you know, ask the disciples. We literally stood right near where, you know, he probably stood with the disciples and people say that I am. And then say that I am. And Peter blurts out and says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus goes on to say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. He said that in front of what the Greek Romans thought were one cave and the temple of Pan, which was one of the seven guardians uh, to the gates of the underworld. Pan was there and they would actually make offerings where they would, uh, the Greeks and the Romans would cut a goat's throat and throw it into the spring there because it actually, the uh, spring flowed it to the, the god Pan uh, that they would have a safe journey when they go to the underworld. And what's interesting is when seven, in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, an earthquake happened the same year, and the cave collapsed so that you could no longer go deep inside it. And, um, you know, in other words, hell will not prevail against the church when that happened, but you could still walk around. You know, we were able to walk around on a lot of the platforms and see some of the pillars. But it's just interesting that uh, Jesus said, you know, that the gates of hell would not be able to prevail. And then later on, he says, and they say, uh, I've given you the keys to the kingdom, Peter, you know, or to the disciples. Whatever you loose in hell. It's very interesting. Um, uh, the Jewish, it's not actually in the Bible, but the Jews used to even talk about that God, Yahweh, had the keys to, to the rain, you know, because in Elisha's day, he was able to let the rain for three and a half years. And, but that's not actually one that's with keys, it's the keys to death and of hell. And we've talked before about how before uh, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Nobody talked about, none of the religions talked about going to heaven. Uh, all of the religions talked about going to exist in the underworld with the souls. The, the, uh, you know, where I am, you can be also. You know, in my in Hades, there was the belief, you know, we don't have time to examine all the passages tonight, but there's the belief that when Jesus rose from the dead, all the Old Testament believers, uh, that had been captive in Sheol or Paradiso were released and followed him into heaven. Uh, uh, you know, it, it really has importance in this thing. Um, you know, he's sitting on the Isle of Patmos and 
John actually thinks there may be coming a time when he's going to die. And I can't remember where the other seven um, gates of hell were supposed to be, but two of them were in Asia Minor, where he was right of Asia Minor. And so they could actually, in fact, later on in one of the places it says, I know that you live in the shadow of Satan's seat where he dwells. And some people take that very literally, that, that there was a throne of Satan there at the time. But we'll get onto that later. So any questions there about the first two keys, the keys to death and the keys to Hades? And How were you spelling Pan? And was that a god? That was odd. He was um, half human, half goat. Okay. Yeah, he played a flute. <laughs> you know. And spelling is P-A-N? P-A-N. Yep, that's it. Yep. And it was the God God Pan. Why were the okay, keys to Hades? What's the purpose for one would think I get one locked in there? Or can they They're jailed them? in there, yeah. And so Jesus says, I've got the keys to get you out. Mm -hmm. And that's what they believe he did. Um Go ahead. It's a second question too. Is that where the Catholics believe that you know they could be purgatory? Purgatory. They believe purgatory was a different place. Okay. Is there a marker anywhere around here? They had it the other night. Okay. All right. Just real quick, and I won't spend too much time. I need a marker. Take your Bibles, though, briefly. Take your, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 23. I'm sorry. Luke 16. Verse 23. Luke 16. We'll start at 19. 16, 19? Yes, please. 16, 19. Luke 16, starting in verse 19. And go through the end of the chapter. Okay, go for it. the 
dead, they will repent. I'm sorry. They had Moses and the prophets let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Okay. In the Old Testament, except for Elijah and Enoch, it never says anything about somebody going to heaven. In fact, King David declares, you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Okay, and then Paul, or Peter, on the day of Pentecost, quotes that in Acts chapter 2. But what they believed in the Old Testament is that there was Abraham's bosom. Paradiso is another, okay? And Paradiso wasn't necessarily a place though, it was a condition of existence. For example, later on, um, the intermediate state of where uh, we go now is also referred to Paradiso and the Garden of Eden was referred to as the Paradiso, okay? But Abraham's bosom was on this side, and then Hades, where the wicked dwell, is on this side. And the rich man was, I mean, yeah, the rich man was over here, and Abraham and Lazarus were over here, okay? But there was a great gulf separating them that no one could cross. You see that? You see what I'm talking about? So he was looking down, and the Bible says that he looked up and across the chasm or the abyss, he sees Abraham and Lazarus on the other side. And he says, and there's water over here, and it's very pleasant. You know, here's the water. And uh fountains and over here it's hot and burning and he's in torment and he says send Lazarus over with just a little water on his finger and Abraham says he can't come over there and you can't come over here you're in your place we're in ours but he wasn't looking up into heaven he was just looking across the abyss to the other side does that make sense to everybody then Jesus in John 14, 1 through 6 says, I go to prepare a place for you. Here's pre place prepared up here. Okay? And basically, the impression is that the beds are being made, you know, everything's getting ready in his father's house. So when Jesus died on the cross, he goes down. He gets everybody out of Abraham's bosom, and then he takes them to heaven. Okay, does that make sense? Now, what happens is he goes down, gets them, and then goes back up. Somebody turn to Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 through 53. Matthew 27. 51 yes, would you read it? At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and the tombs um, opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection and went into the Holy Spirit. When Jesus resurrected, other people were resurrected with him. And it's called the first fruits, the first resurrection. A lot of people skip over that and never even see Matthew 27, 51 through 53. And the ones that had died recently actually go back in and visit their families. 
sort of a little scary, don't you think? <laughs> Yeah, whoop. Okay, good question though. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, starting at verse 11. Carla, would you read that for us? John chapter 20, verse 11. <coughs> I'm going to answer Michelle's question. Okay, keep going. Oh, okay. And saw and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She <clears throat> said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposedly, she supposedly him to the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabbioni, which to say teacher. Okay, the tomb opened up not to let Jesus out, but to let the disciples in. Does that make sense? All right. And so when Jesus died, he went down into Abraham's bosom and he preached to the captives in prison. Okay. Then after three days, he rose again. So here he is outside the tomb. And Mary sees him and wants to grab him by the legs and wants to hug him. She's happy to see him. What does he say to her? Don't, Don't do it yet because I have not yet ascended to my father, which means he hasn't been up there for three days. You know, some people believe that he went to heaven for three days. No, he went down. Then he, he comes, appears, and at the same time that he's talking to Mary, other people are appearing to their loved ones because they have not yet ascended to the Father. And then she turns around, and boom, he's gone. Now later on, he appears to Thomas, and what does he say? Touch my hands and feet. My job's done. It's finished. But while Jesus is talking to, to, to Mary... Other people are walking around waiting for him to get this show on the road. <laughs> okay? Wow. And so they go on up. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, Somebody read 8 through 10. That's why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he met a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. And so right there it says that he led captives free from captivity as he ascended. There's other places that say that he preached to the spirits in prison. So while he was down there for three days, he was basically answering questions. You know, and also 
preaching to the ones that are lost, saying everything that the prophets and I said to you was true. Okay? Let me see if I can find that one. You mean Second Peter, where he talks about going down, descending, and preaching to yes. the folks down there? Is it Second Peter? I believe it's in Second Peter. Somebody turn to 1 Peter 4, 6. But that's not the same one. Keep looking, Ted. 4, 6? Yes. For this is the cause, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So right there it says, it was preached even to those that were dead. And there's another place where it says that he actually, Jesus preached to the spirits that were in prison. Mm -hmm. Now there's enough, now this is not a doctrine to hang your hat on and insist on, but there's enough scripture there that if you connect the dots and put it together, it's something that, you know, I believe. Uh, but we do know that in the Old Testament, it talked about nobody going to heaven. Everybody went to Sheol, and the word Sheol meant more than just the grave. Some denominations will say Sheol is just another word for grave. That's only true if you think of the grave as more than just a hole in the ground, but the grave as the place where the souls of the departed go and exist. So, so that's the answer. That's the long answer to Jesus having the keys to death and Hades is that he is the only one that can raise us from the dead. He can call us from the dead. And he also can deliver those of the Old Testament out of Hades. We don't ever have to go to Sheol, but Sheol is still there. Hades is still there. And the wicked go. It's just Abraham's bosom is empty. This, this also, I guess we're probably off the track, but, you know, there's a, there's a um, contrast in thought. Some, some people think that when you die, you're dead, and that's it, until Christ comes and takes you back. And other, other people believe that when our body is dead, we're with Christ. We go with him right then. And this kind of, to me, when, when I look at this and listen to this, he took those that were in Abraham's bosom up. There is no place for us to go right. of, except to him. Well, and when the thief was on the cross, yeah. Yeah. Jesus yeah. says, you will be with me this day where? In paradise. In, in paradise. You know, now paradise, again, isn't simply a location. It's a state of existence. Paradise was in the garden, perfect. Paradise was in Abraham's bosom. And then paradise will ultimately be the paradise of God in heaven, wherever the tree of life is. Dana? Read that one. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, and hoped to be in the fulfillment of the spirits of the prisons, which was laid formerly did not obey, but was in doubt, taking to the days of those that perish. Far all the rest were received with the word in which a few by the saints were preserved by the faith. So that's first Peter three, eight through twelve or thirteen or fourteen. Yeah, through 18. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's the one I was thinking yeah. of. But it actually says that he went down and preached to the spirits in prison. You know, and it's hard to, to rationalize that away. Jesus didn't, because there's no knowledge of Jesus ever going to a prison while he was on this planet, you know, to preach to the rebellious. And I think he went down, and he may have even gone down as far as Tartarus, because there are there's a place in, called Tartarus where there are angels chained up that violated their first estate at the time of Noah. So let's pick it up just a little bit though. Uh, Roman numeral two, the second set of keys is the keys to the kingdom of heaven. 
Matthew 16, 17 through 21. Can somebody read that for us? And Jesus answered them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Okay, now, now, you know, there's a number of different ways to read that, but um, you know, there is an extension of power where we as a church can bind and loose things, and this isn't taught much anymore, much anymore. but um, it seems to uh, well, let's just turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Somebody read 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. This is one of the places where the, the uh, binding and loosing actually takes place with a member. Keep going. Among the Gentiles, that a man have his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him. Okay, so right there, it describes a situation of church discipline, which sadly isn't practiced much in churches anymore, but basically it says that if there's someone that claims to be a Christian, that's involved in church, you know, a member, and considered part of the body, and they are living in gross immorality and sin, that the church is supposed to uh, cast them out. Uh, and turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh even though his spirit will be saved so it's not saying that this person will lose their salvation but it is saying that that the church has the power to remove the protective umbrella of God's protection from that individual to leave them open to satanic attack and destruction of the flesh you know, whether that's sickness or what, you know, the, the picture though is like what happened with Job. Milton? That's the loosing part. What about the binding? He was asking what the binding part is. This is the loosing part. Um, is that salvation? I think. Yes, but because really and truly, or it's scripture. I think scripture is the key here. And the reason I say that is later on, one of the other keys was the key of knowledge that had been given to the scribes and the scribes had not used it and hidden it from the people, which means that they had hidden the Old Testament and the Old Testament truths that could have been used to give the people the knowledge and understanding of how to follow God. And so I believe that the key to the kingdom of heaven is actually the gospel, you know, and that, but if somebody is living like the devil, you, you need to send them out because they really aren't living their life according to the gospel. But the gospel is the real key by which we measure and lock and unlock. 
But I think whenever we share the plan of salvation and somebody's heart is saved, they're being given the key to get into heaven. Jesus and then he does the talking to the angels. Okay. You know? Um, <coughs> but I, I think that the binding and the loosing is through prayer. I, and I could be wrong at this, but I truly believe that no one gets saved unless you pray for them first. Even before you talk to them. That prayer is when the binding and the loosing comes. You know? And that when you pray for somebody's heart, I pray all the time, Lord, place a hedge of protection around that person, touch their hearts, open their eyes. But you, literally, you're binding the forces of evil so that the gospel can get through. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, that if our gospel, if they're blinded, they're blinded by the evil one who does not want to let them see the glory of the gospel of Christ. Uh, somebody turn real quick and read. 1 Corinthians 4. Hold on. 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. It's right near where... Uh, excuse me. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. See, Satan blinds people, and so we have the power to pray that Satan would be bound so that he would not be able to blind them. You see what I'm saying? But God does the binding, not us. Yeah, God does the binding and the loosing. Because it's either like the one yeah, yeah, like exactly. they talk to things like, we bind you. Right. In the yeah, in the name of Jesus yeah. and all that. I, I just believe it's prayer. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. The health and wealth, that whole thing. Uh, point number four. Sorry. I mean, point number three is uh, the key to the house of David. Why do you think it's important for the Messiah to have the key to the house of David? Because he's a descendant of David. Yeah. By the Davidic covenant. You know, when usually, not always, but usually when somebody passes away, the key to their house goes to their children, right? Or to whoever's left. And it, it means ownership. In this case, the key means ownership that Jesus is the rightful King of Kings and Lord of Lords that's supposed to take David's throne because the Bible promises that someone from the house of David will sit on the throne of God eternally or the, the throne eternally in reign. Of, of David, the throne of David. And so, you know, Isaiah 22 says, I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open it, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. That's that's a messianic prophecy. Well, that's why they call Jesus the son of David. Yeah. Those who truly believe that he was Messiah would have seen that. As the son of David. Yeah. And son of David. Dave, uh, uh, Jesus was the son of David, both legally through Joseph, his, his father, right. but also biologically, both Mary and Joseph's lineage. Both of them. So he had it by blood, but also by legal, because 
uh, a father could adopt, you know, and that, that Jesus was heir through both lines. <clears throat> Just like we're adopted into the family of God by Romans 8, and yes. we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And we are co-heirs with Christ. Yeah. Fourth key, the key of knowledge. Luke eleven fifty two says, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who are entering. Again, I think it's talking about scripture. And they're saying, you aren't saved, but you're also making it impossible for other people to study scripture and be saved themselves as well. So the key of knowledge is tied to the keys to the kingdom. And the last one is, this is an unusual one, and this sort of implies that there are probably more spiritual keys out there, but we just don't know what they are, but the key to the abyss, the key to the bottomless pit, and the Greek word there is abyssos, or abyssos, abyss. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from that shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of corpions of the earth. Uh, most people think that that's Satan that has fallen from heaven, that is going to, you know, because Jesus actually says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And usually when an angel falls, fallen angels, you know, it's not a righteous angel, but it's, you know, and uh, the angels are often referred to as stars, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And the tail of the dragon swept a third of the stars from heaven. Yes, yeah. So those are the five keys mentioned in scripture. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move on next week, and uh, we are, I was going to do the uh, nine mysteries of Scripture, but I'm going to hold off on that. The word mysterion is used throughout Revelation, and so I'll pick up on that. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 2. Sweet. And we're going to pick up the, the pace a little bit. We're going to study the church of Ephesus. There's a lot of stuff in there, but we'll go over. And so for the next seven Bible studies on Wednesday nights, when we're not having a business meeting, we're going to study the seven churches of Asia Minor and what God reveals spiritually to each of them, what their problem was, but also there's doctrine sort of hidden in there, um, you know, that we can flesh out as we're studying. All right, let's go to the Lord now in a word of prayer. Gracious Jesus, we thank you that you have given us your scripture and the gospel, which is like a key that gets us into heaven by following you and, and worshiping you and becoming your child. Lord Jesus, we realize that you really hold all the keys, that you are in control of all things and that you can open whatever you want to open and you can shut whatever you can need to shut. <coughs> so I pray, Lord, that you would open people's hearts, that there would be a revival. We pray that you would bless our church and our church would grow and be reaching more and more people with your uh, gospel of love. And help us to uh, follow you faithfully and to conduct ourselves, Lord, the way you would have us to conduct ourselves. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. I'm surprised we had viewers. There were actually three viewers. This thing was cutting in and out throughout uh, the whole thing. Or somebody was, Sunday was.